So let's start the second panel of the day. This will be about the future neutrino experiments. Um, so we prepared some questions for the panel, some general questions, but let's start as the previous panel if anyone in the audience will have any follow-up question for any of the previous speakers. Please let me know. Mateus, uh, I don't know if I should take this microphone. Maybe I can just ask and someone repeats and like. No, no, you can. Okay. Uh, vague question. Suppose Arcadi was right and there is some Dirac neutrino mass and let the numbers conserve. What do we do? It's open ended question. I don't think I should start with an answer. So uh, that would be very exciting uh, because that's not what anybody expects. Uh, at least uh, most people in this room don't expect that. Uh, and, and just from a, an operational point of view, that's a difficult discovery to make because you can't prove that the neutrinos are Dirac. Uh, you can prove that they're not Dirac. Uh, but I suspect if we ended up in a world like that, where the neutrinos are Dirac, then we would conclude that the, that that lepton numbers at least have very good approximate symmetry. Uh, and I think we would, first of all, uh, have to try to understand if the very small neutrino masses are indicative of something. So it is possible that the neutrino masses are very small, even though they're Dirac fermions, and maybe they're very small for some reason. It could be some other symmetry that prevents the neutrinos from getting a mass unless you break that symmetry and that makes the neutrino masses very small. So that's one direction we would go. Another funny question people would ask is, uh, if you listen to your formal friends, they will tell you that left one number cannot be exact because of a quantum gravity effects. So that means that even though it looks like the neutrinos are direct fermions, they really aren't. And that left one number is broken at a super tiny level and that the neutrinos might have a very, very small Majorana mass. And one way you would go about trying to find this is to look for what's called the pseudo Dirac neutrinos. So you would look for new oscillation lengths that are very, very long, way bigger than you know, the types of oscillation lengths that we have access to. And you would start to carve away in that direction to see if your quantum gravity friends are right. And that even though it looks like the neutrinos are Dirac fermions, they really are not. They're just uh, just that lepton number is broken at a very, very low or very, very high scale, depending on how you look at it. I think that's where we would be going. Yeah. Is there anything specific to that? Uh, there are. Uh, so there's sensitivity to pseudo Dirac neutrinos and solar data. Uh, so you can take one of your, uh, you know, one, two, three states, and you could give it a little splitting, and make them into a Dirac state. And with uh, solar data, you can access delta m squares, which are of order 10 to minus 11 electron volts squared. And we haven't seen those, so that rules out that this uh, little mass splitting has to be less than something. And then if you look at neutrinos that come from very far away, like uh, supernova explosions and whatnot, they sometimes, if you're lucky, they contain information about whether the neutrinos are pseudo Dirac. These are the different directions that I that I know about. I just it's just that the idea of direct neutrinos is, is um, from an astrophysical standpoint dangerous, right? I mean, because you can flip the spin, and there has to be some physics to increase the mass of the of the right-handed states. If if the masses are the same, then they have to be that to be very, very small, right, in order to avoid populating right-handed states, either in core collapse supernovae, where neutrinos scatter something like 10 to the 10 times on their way out. So anyway, just, just saying, the stakes are high. All right. 
Any other questions from the audience? Hi, just one question about the Dune and the measurement of uh, supernova neutrinos. Um, so you, you saw a plot where you were having the, the number of events as a function of time, and it was going from very early time up to very late time. But I guess there will be a, some background that at some point limits the, the measurement of supernova or supernova neutrinos. So what is the, the minimum time that we can distinguish a supernova in Dune, and also actually how far we can go in time just for this measurement? Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that one. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Is, uh, I my... think it, we included well. Alex is here. We have been conveners of the supernova working group in Dune. So yeah, I mean, we included backgrounds in order to to estimate precisely the trigger efficiency. So and uh, according to the simulations that we did. Um, Accepting uh, one fake trigger per month, we could reach up to 99% trigger efficiency up to, let's say, 20 kiloparsec or so. I mean, otherwise, the trigger efficiency starts to, to decrease because of the, of the lack of statistics uh, in Dune. But this has been uh, already uh, included. They are not so critical. I mean, it's not like for the solar studies, of course, uh, but for the neutrino burst, it affects mainly the, the trigger uh, efficiency as a function of the distance on the statistics that we have. Okay, any other question? Otherwise, I would go with some general question for our panelists. First one would be, uh, what are the main open questions that future neutrino experiments, not only long baseline, future neutrino experiments, will answer in this decade and in the next one? Which ones will remain unanswered and why? What are, what are the limiting factors that we would um, not allow us to, to go to, to other? measurements. So I don't know who would like to start, David. Sure. Um, yeah, very excellent question. So um, I'll start with the last part. Uh, I think we talked a bit about it. I think unitarity will be remain unanswered for a while. Uh, and um, uh, I actually, uh, in, in addition to the approach to tau neutrino, that I'd be interested in kind of thoughts on uh, neutral current channels uh, as a probe for this, maybe through not long baseline probes uh, experiments, but uh, kind of new ways of looking at oscillations, such as with the uh, uh, sevens interactions, uh, as uh, as an example. So I, I mentioned this because I think it is uh, an excellent way of looking at the problem, rather than just making measurements that are more and more precise. Finding a question to test that's really exciting. Uh, I think the unitarity question is really one of the fundamental ones that we, we face, uh, but uh, I, I don't yet see the, 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 the clear path forward that brings to a satisfactory uh, uh, answer in, 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 the, in the next decade, which is, I guess, is, uh, yeah. So that, that, that's what, what I'd like to say for this for now. Anyone else would like to answer? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, predictions are always dangerous, especially when they involve the future. So uh, it's. But we are talking about mm. neutrino experiments, yeah. and we are designing experiments right yeah. now to, I mean, to catch some, I mean, at least to answer some questions or to make some measurements. So. Yeah. So so I mean, so I think we will uh, we will definitely answer the question of the mass ordering. Yeah. Uh, we will answer the question of uh, at least large CP violation. Uh, we. Uh, we will definitely uh, not answer the question of sterile neutrinos. <laughs> <laughs> so that I think is one of the things that will be unanswered. Actually, the list of things that is unanswered is uh, is probably large. Uh, we will probably not answer the uh, the question of uh, the Mariano nature of the neutrino. Because yes. this is a, a um, lack I mean, of capability for the 
experiments that are being designed or why? Yeah, you think that we are uh, not going to reach that? Uh, it is simply that uh, there, are, uh, there, there are too many unknowns. Mm. So we are, we are going to probe the uh, inver inverted mass hierarchy for the, uh, for the neutrino list double beta decay measurements. I think that's safe to assume that that will, that will be the case. But uh, it the, uh, the the mass term is not the only one that contributes to uh, neutrino less double beta decay. Although in term, I, I'm told that if you have neutrino less double beta dec uh, decay, it uh, implies a neutrino mass simply by that uh, by that diagram. So it's not just a question of uh, of the. Uh, quality of the experiments. And then one of my favorites, I wanna mention of things that are probably not going to be answered in uh, in my lifetime, <laughs> I'm making a bit longer even than, uh, than the next decade is uh, the uh, angular distribution of the relic neutrino background. So you're very optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying this will not be answered. <laughs> I, I can add a couple of things. So the, the other thing that will happen that will be interesting will be uh, that there, there should be a, a, a cosmological measurement of a non-zero neutrino mass. So if you believe your survey friends, they tell us that they should see the effect of a non-zero neutrino mass at at least the three sigma level. That, and that should happen by the end of this decade, if you, again, you know, giving them a few more years than what they normally say. That, that will be exciting, especially if they get the wrong answer. No, but, but the other thing before George makes a comment that I think, you know, in the context of oscillations, which I didn't mention is, uh, it would be really nice if we could study new E to new mu oscillations, which have, we have never been able to do, right? We only measure new E disappearance at low energies, or we measure new mu changing into other flavors at high energies. We don't know how to do an experiment with new E oscillating into new mu, or new mu or new e oscillating into new tau, unless you have something like a neutrino factory. Yeah, right. That would be the ultimate way of uh, over constraining your parameter space. Mm. And by the way, it's the only way to look for T violation. Mm. So if you want to study T violation, you could study new mu to new e, compare it with new e to new mu. If you're lucky, uh, that doesn't even that doesn't depend on matter effects. If your matter effects are T invariant. So if you did one experiment with new e to new mu and new mu to new e, you could study the t invariance violation directly, and it, it would never depend on the matter effects. That would be a great experiment to do. I'm pretty sure we're not going to do it this decade. No. If I were to place a bet, I would say we probably would not be able to do it by the end of the next decade. But we probably know how to do it in principle if we just had enough resources and if people were just excited about that. Um, to, to your uh, comment that the most interesting thing would be a discrepancy between the cosmological measurement and, and laboratory measurements, I, I agree completely. That's the most interesting thing, and I'm hoping the most likely. Um, to your pessimistic comment, Michael, that, you know, you're not going to be able to, uh, you'll, you'll never know the angular distribution of the relic background. Keep in mind that the surface of last scattering of the neutrinos is actually fairly close because the neutrinos are, are massive. So that Ptolemy actually, uh, that experiment is talking about the very thing that you don't think you're going to see. I thought it was just going to give us time to discover the... Use the microphone. They may not be able to do it, but if they, you know, the point is if there's some directionality in that experiment. So they point towards the galactic center and they point away from it, for example. Oh, so I see. Uh, just very, very roughly. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Lee, would you like to comment on this? Uh, I don't think I have a whole lot more to add. I think I can add my name in the list of people that think in the next decade we should definitely have the mass hierarchy and probably CP violation uh, in the bag. And then it's a uh, after that, yeah, like Andrew said, it's a it's a discussion of how much of how well we need to know things versus how much it costs to know things more than we will then. So um, precision tests on unitarity, uh, 
I guess will come with some risk versus a reward situation in the future. Well, one, one thing that uh, was not mentioned that much so far is the neutrinos from the Big Bang that will not be discovered or that will not be measured in the next decade. But what about thermal neutrinos from the stars, especially from the sun? They are much higher energies, well, higher than the cosmic neutrino background, and there is a fighting chance of detecting them. Do you believe that uh, within the next two decades they can be detected? How do you do it? Well, one possibility is to capture a nuclei with zero Q value. I mean, there are people who are trying to explore that. Uh, you mean in a coherent type experiment? Yeah, perhaps, yes. That would be one possibility. You know, that, that would be a great measurement to make. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it would be fun to come up with a way of doing that. We were talking about this in one of these, you know, during lunch last week. If you put a detector very close to the sun, you, you, sh you might be able to do it. And you could do it using these coherent scattering processes because these detectors are not so big. So they could fit into the, the next uh, Parker probe or something. And, uh, but yeah, that, that would be a fun measurement to make. Okay, let's change topic. I'm going back to a question that was already raised several times today. Do we really need different experiments to answer the same questions and or to provide the same measurements? Because here we are not talking about, I mean, small experiments. We are talking about huge experiments that imply to, con to convince many people and many funding agencies to, to build them. So, do we really need them or we can just have one big and small one or, you know, leave? <laughs> I, I hope most people here would agree the answer is yes. Um, I, I think in the current generation, we're seeing the um, advantage of having both of them. Um, I mean, you can just do a quick thought experiment what the current thoughts on CP violation would be if we had only one of the experiments running at the moment, we'd either be, you know, probably at the point of celebration if it was T2K and maybe disappointed if it was just Nova. So um, uh, I think the value of having two is probably going to be even bigger uh, in the future because we're going to need to make uh, bigger claims about what we're potentially discovering. Um, and perhaps the complementarity of Hyper-K in June is even larger than um, what it currently is between NOVA and T2K, particularly in the, the fact that there's now going to be a, a fairly big difference between the narrow and wide band themes, um, uh, as well as the differences in the way things will be measured. So um, I think definitely, yes, uh, I can hand over. Yeah, let me... Uh... Let me just say, in, in principle, yes, we should always have more than one experiment. The question is more, what are we willing to sacrifice to get, uh, <laughs> uh, get the redundancy? Yeah. And I think we should be ready to sacrifice quite a lot because it doesn't help us if we build knowledge that turns out to be ultimately not true or uh, because of some background that was not understood. We can make a similar argument, but if there was only Alice in deep about this, uh, the question of the stellar neutrino. So uh, I think uh, the entire idea of physics is built on reproducibility. And so to have uh, more, uh, more than one experiment see, uh, seeing the same effect is, is an advantage. And of course, we want to have the experiments slightly different so that we, uh, we view the same problem from a different angle. The, the, the real problem is, is that these experiments are so, so expensive. Yeah, so, because in the case of the LHC, yeah. for example, yeah. we have CMS, Atlas, and so on, but it's the same infrastructure, right? Yeah. While here we are talking about two different infrastructures, two different technologies, you mean, um, 
Yeah, but, but even there, I would prefer if there was another experiment that sees the Higgs, one that isn't on the same accelerator. I would prefer it, but uh, the <laughs> question is whether I would want to spend uh, $10 billion to get it. <laughs> so I think the, the real question is how much other things that we can't do in neutrino physics would we be willing to sacrifice? And that's a much harder question to answer. Just one word on this. Um, I obviously agree. Um, and having confirmation from both Hyperkay and Dune is going to be very important. It, it would also probably be good to plan ahead for uh, how to make sure that, well, think about the other scenario, right, with Nova and, and, and uh, T2K were in some sense the other scenario right now. And in some sense, it's a teaser for uh, Dune and Hyperk and, and, and a justification for these enhanced programs. Uh, because we're relying so much on the idea of both as a confirmation of, a, of this measurement, uh, but because of all the kind of knowledge on kind of just how complex the measurements are, it would be good to start thinking ahead in terms of what it what what things might look like if we don't end up in a situation where the two confirm each other, uh, that could be exciting. It could be frustrating. And uh, how do how do we move beyond that uh, in a in a way that yeah is a uh, constructive. Yeah, similar situation also happens in Ice Cube and KM3 Net, if you want, right? They are somehow also trying to explode this uh, complementarity between the north and the south, and you know, I mean. This is being repeated in many in many places. Any other comment about this question? Sure. Uh, I guess maybe this is kind of picking up from what you said. Um, but if you know, we hear a little bit uh, like in the snow mass process about other possible future experiments. So one that you know you kind of hear about is uh, a neutrino factory as a sort of stepping stone to uh, a muon collider, right? Yeah. So this has sort of come back again. And so I kind of listening to these discussions in SNOMAS, I was kind of thinking how important is it that we uh, think to support this, you know, next step? Uh, you know, is, the, is that just gonna be redundant with uh, June and Hyper-K or is that something that we really, really need to support like in general as a community? Uh, opinions would be great. I, I, you know, I, I have a blank page on this. I, I'll say a word, but I don't know if I have much to elaborate on except for related to the snow mass process. I think it is in some sense, it's still quite near term, uh, at least this snow mass process, at, le at least for, for us in neutrino physics. Uh, and I agree, it, looking a bit beyond that, uh, is something that maybe deserves some attention uh, while at the same time making sure that what we've set out to, to achieve uh, still gets the support it needs uh, through this snow mass process. So it's a bit of a hard balance to play. I agree, it's an important topic. Can I ask you this for example, Alex? No, you go ahead. You are the panelist. <laughs> so I, I, I think the interesting question that, that I don't think is gonna come out um, or the answer that's not gonna come out of this is snow mass, but it probably should at some level is uh, so, so we're gonna run, let's say we run Dune and Hyper-K and we get to 2040. Uh, the questions we would like to know the answer to now are, do we wanna do another neutrino experiment after those two? And, and again, you know, the answer is not clear. I, I think the answer is probably going to be yes, but it will probably be yes for different reasons. It might be yes because Dune and Hyper-K disagree in some unresolvable way which is possible. I mean, uh, uh, if you take the, the NOVA and T2K results and you run them to the extreme, we could be in a situation where they perfectly disagree. And Dune and Hyper-K will be systematics dominated. And you don't know which systematics are the wrong ones. Let's put it that way. So you might need to resolve that. We might be in a world where we have some small hint for some new phenomenon. And then we would like to uh, uh, learn more about that. But again, Dune and Hyper-K have run out of fuel. So, so thinking about whether we want a new neutrino oscillation experiment after NOVA and T2K is a very important question to ask now, because if the answer is yes, you have to decide, can we do something better than Dune and Hyper-K? 
And can we do it in a way, and, and what should we be doing now to be prepared, you know, 10 years from now to start building that new thing? Uh, I think that the neutrino factor is the one thing that I know about that could give you a, a, a qualitatively better neutrino beam, and it gives you the electron flavor as well. Uh, but I don't know if that's good enough because, you know, we know the systematics are, could be dominated by cross-section uncertainties. We know that the neutrino factory is optimal when you have a magnetized detector and, and Dune is not magnetized. I don't think we can put a solenoid around Dune, uh, although that would be fun. Uh, so, so that's the, I think that's a question that we are not asking enough because we're very worried about the near future, which we should be. But I think it's important to ask the question, you know, are we going to be doing more oscillation experiments when, when you guys are my age? Or uh, are we going to be done? You know, are we going to say, okay, we've done all we can do with neutrino oscillations. Let's go do something else. And, and I think if the answer is that we do want to do more experiments, what should those experiments be? You know, people like to talk about, you know, pion decay at rest sources. And that's a way to go that nobody or very few people are thinking about. But I think we have to go through the exercise of asking what might be the questions that we're asking and how do we do a better oscillation experiment? And it's not going to be a super duper K. I, I think that hopefully that's, I, I, I sus, yeah. Well, I, to follow up on this discussion on what is redundant or not. So first of all, Dune and hyper K in the world where there is uh, additional physics beyond the minimal three flavor oscillation, they are measuring different things so they are not redundant, even at zero order, right? So this is important. As Andre said, the most exciting scenario would be if we're trying to check whether this simple picture is correct. And the most exciting thing would be to find something beyond it. And if you only have one experiment, you may miss that there is something beyond it. So this is not a small part, right? But then even within the framework that you have three flavor oscillations in the world where cross sections are not perfectly understood, they are also not identical. And so maybe what we could discuss here at which level will experimentalists be forced to worry about cross sections before they do an oscillation fit? Because right now they're still coasting on this past glory where they could do you know, atmospheric neutrino studies with up and down ratio where things sort of cancel. So they, they can still think that they do cross sections on the side, right? And I think in the future, it will be your understanding of cross sections will be an absolute prerequisite before you make uh, any conclusion from Dune or Hyper-K. So I wonder at which point this transition will come that there will be, for until you study cross sections and publish a detailed paper and prove that you are able to reproduce many measurements with electrons and neutrinos, until you do that, nobody will believe your oscillation fit. So I wonder when that will come. Maybe after, you know, five years of Dune and Hyper K or something, but I don't know, maybe people already thought about that. Ravi? Just one word of this. I don't have a. Uh, I have one possible answer. In some sense, the the boundary condition, psychologically, at least I think for many, is kind of new physics uh, as a way to uh, kind of have, having the prerequisite of the cross section understanding. Because in, in some sense, uh, as long as you're measuring parameters that you believe exist, uh, you're you can be. Um, misguided by uncertainties in your cross section, uh, but you're gonna plow ahead anyway and, and just report that measurement. Uh, and, and that's dangerous, but I think that's what we're doing. Uh, and uh, the other spectrum is, the other side of the spectrum is uh, if you're using your neutrino detector with the intrinsic neutrinos as a background to then claim some new physics beyond it, that's when you, that, that's when I think when Everyone comes at you and says, "Well, no, uh, your uh, your cross section model is uh, uh, something that you haven't demonstrated that you understand well enough to make that claim." So, um, yeah, I, I think that's the, where the boundary is now, and I think you're suggesting that uh, for the. Well, I'm suggesting that even if you 
might have told you that there are only two flavor assays. Yeah. yeah. So one another couple of effects, like the two violations of some precision. We're talking about five percent or four percent somewhere. There is a boundary where you're just not able to shoot for that precision. Mm -hmm. you, understand, you have a better framework and more robust receptor framework. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Good thing, what that boundary is. Mm -hmm. It's an open question. It's not an Absolutely. Not now the answer. Yeah, obviously, this is not this is not a hard boundary. Uh, so, uh, as you sort of suggested, we are kind of muddling through, and we will continue to do that until we can't anymore. And that, uh, that I think is somewhere at that point where we are dominated by systematic effects. Oh, and and then, then we, need, we need some kind of cross check that our understanding of our systematic effects right. is. Uh, yes, well, because you, there could be some, uh, some unknown. Yeah. So it's it's hard to say at uh, at what kind of percentage you stop believing the uh, the systematic errors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in 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 my opinion, God created the uh, the neutrinos and the leptons, and uh, the devil created the quarks. <laughs> so uh, there there is, however, of course, one. Uh, uh, one thing and that is uh, the uh, Juno measurement are not going to be uh, depending on cross section uncertainty, at least for the mass hierarchy. So, so that's that sort of is out of the uh, out of the discussion. Of course, they can't measure the CP violation, uh, but uh, but there's this one cross section that we do understand, and that's that's the inverse beta of uh, low energy neutrino. No, I, I agree with you that there will be some there will be some kind of a tipping point where you say, okay, this this becomes ridic ridiculous. This kind of tuning of the uh, of the models that we do in each experiment requires a slightly different tuning. And uh, what is really the impact of getting it disastrously wrong uh, in terms of uh, of the oscillation parameter that you extract? Yes, so I, I think people, I think we've seen this morning that people are taking this very seriously, um, particularly, especially from NOVA and T2K. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not on either of those experiments, but as far as I can tell, a lot of the work that goes on now is purely dedicated to, to this sort of thing. Um, I mean, Callum can uh, comment further if, if he wants. And then we also saw from Ornella the there's a massive cross-section program as part of the, the short baseline program. Um, and so that will all have converged by the time we're making precision measurements um, in these future long baseline uh, experiments. So I think people are definitely taking it very seriously. Um, on the other hand, uh, in terms of just trying to uh, tune models we have as opposed to new models, um, I realize neutrino cross sections maybe aren't the uh, most enticing theoretical thing to work on compared to uh, big discoveries at the LHC with the understanding of model physics and things. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a, 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 it's a good concern to have. Um, and I mean, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been sitting here worrying about uh, meson exchange currents and 2B2H. So you're right that big surprises can uh, crop up um, but I, I think people are definitely taking it seriously, so um, I'm not too concerned about it right now. <laughs> okay, Callum.
how they suffer this for three percent period, how they combine more phenomenal methods, better theory which is required to fix up the framework in the generator. Some level there may not be a tool that fits all the data. So this great talk which was given in this program on the second week is uh, it's available online by Daniel Rutherford and uh, he shows a detailed analysis of Minerva data. You have 305 degrees of freedom and x squared of five, seven, ten thousand in that case. And that's from one extract using every available generator on the market. Every tool that is closely is close to these kinds of numbers. So it's an interesting physics problem for for some people understanding PCB and big transition regimes from sort of low energy nuclear physics to conservative PCB is that's fascinating on its own. And there, there exists an answer, right? You don't have to imagine that there is a key prime for it to be relevant or not, right? It's just it's there and you need to understand it. But anyway, so Hello? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I, I, you know, I agree that this is really important. And I mean, I worry a lot about cross sections. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that with the, the current um, uh, experiments, we do, to, to come back to one of your uh, earlier points, we do try and test whether we're still statistically limited through the use of fake data studies. Now, they might not be the right degrees of freedom, but we try and mess with the model in all the ways we can think of, which is obviously not complete, but it's sort of the best we can do right now. And we check that the oscillation results are not horribly biased, right? So that's an important test. There is a, a, a step change, I think, coming up. I mean, when we do the same sort of tests with June sensitivity studies, we can have problems, right? And one way to try and get around that is, uh, you know, the June prism uh, concept that Lee discussed earlier, and also on uh, Hyper-K, the uh, uh, intermediate water strain cop detector, it is kind of sidestepping uh, the cross-section problem to some extent, but not completely. And of course, SVND prism as well. Um, so, so that's one alternative approach. But I do completely agree that uh, it is important to try and uh, come up with a model that can agree with all the data. And I'll add another bomb into the mix that not all the data is equal, right? A lot of data is produced that is very seriously affected by the assumptions made in extracting that data. Exactly the problem you're worried about for the oscillation physics can impact the measurements of the cross section. And so it could be that you know, there is no data, there is no model that will agree with all the published neutrino uh, nucleus data because some of it is polluted. That's what keeps me up at night. Wow. And what would add to your aggravation is that the underlying model was erroneous in physics in Hong Kong. And it's interesting that when we look at the Western studies, Marta will talk about this tomorrow, that there's these huge problems that need to manage. And what do they imply for systematic modeling? Shift the parameters. Nobody has done, I think we're not trying to do that yet, something that gives us unity to think about in connection with human decisions. For no matter are things that, there's different situations for appearance. Okay, sorry, I need to cut the discussion because we have our panelists here. I would like to last just go with one more question because we are in the at the KITP. So I would like to know from our panelists what is the what do you think is the role of the theory community in the future neutrino experimental program, which is being defined right now? What get... should be or what is what is and what should be? <laughs> oh, okay. oh, 
I'm the first to make that. I can say something, but I'll wait for. Could okay, be, then, then I'm risking to, uh, to to say something. I mean, one thing that I think uh, the, uh, the theory community can do to help in particular double beta decay experiment is to address the question of matrix elements. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, since we just talked uh, for 20 minutes about cross sections, I won't mention those. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but any, uh, any help with Coming up with uh, with better models uh, for uh, for neutrino cross sections and correlations with other processes like electron scattering uh, would also be helpful. So, what one thing I'll add um, is uh, touching on one of the themes from Andre's talk: um, how we're designing experiments where we can't promise anything. Uh, so one thing that is very appealing, though, about the experiments we're making is that um, they have at least a concrete deliverable in terms of, for example, delta CP. But what gets us excited is what can what those experiments can see beyond that. And that's where, uh, and this is something Ornette also talked about in her talk, um, the interplay between the experiments and the theory community in kind of finding interesting questions to tackle and uh, then devising an experimental program or even within the experiment, an analysis program that can address those questions uh, is really important because yes, we have these kind of primary goals, but uh, the experiments are so versatile and in some sense the cost makes you want to make sure that they're versatile so that they have a broad program. And, um, and I think that necessarily requires uh, th this connection in terms of finding interesting questions to tackle and then from the, and with the experimentalists uh, devising analysis strategies that allow you to tackle them. I'll quickly follow up on that for a second. And yeah. should finish. <laughs> I, I, I think that some, uh, the kind of the simplest thing is to actually just, you know, engage with the experiments at, at the design stage that we're at now. Um, I mean, I, I think all of us want to have as wide physics programs as we can have. It, it helps the experiment. It helps helps the the model builders and the theorists so um that's definitely something we want to happen i mean when i was at cern for example the the theory group there would uh some of them came to us about uh, some dark matter searches that maybe we could try and do a prototype um and that was the the kind of first thing that we thought okay what can we do beyond our uh hydronic cross-section measurements for example so um I think that's very valuable, um, and I think we're getting past the uh, us and them situation with theorists and experimentalists. So uh, let's keep doing that. So the so the one issue I did want to add to, especially given the the diversity of the audience here, is uh, if you like uh, supernova neutrinos and you don't have a theorist friend, uh, you will probably not measure anything that's useful at all. That, that's the one thing where, you know, whatever you measure will be completely uh, uh, dominated by whatever the modelers are doing. And I think that that's one area where for sure, uh, you know, the, you need the theorists to tell you what your result means, almost literally, unless all you want to do is discover that a supernova has gone off. So I think that's one thing that we don't want to forget. You know, for the, for, for, for the, the other issues, of course, that I, I work on that, so I have to agree. But I think it's also important for us to, you know, think back and, and see how other communities uh, work with the neutrino community. And, and especially this issue of, you know, the theorists allowing you to ask a more diverse set of questions is a big deal. I mean, if you talk to your collider friends, a lot of people spend a lot of their time, you know, plowing through their collider data, looking for things that probably don't exist, but that the theorists came up with. And, and that has driven a lot of the, you know, detector development and what are the things that are important to measure? What are the questions you should be asking? What are the, you know, what are the problems you need to solve first? And I think a lot of that comes from this exchange between the theorists who tend to have, uh, uh, in quotes, more ideas that are not useful, but they can be more creative that way. And, and the experimentalists who can sort of determine, oh, we don't know how to do this, but we could learn how to do that. And I think that the theory tends to provide the motivation that you know, helps you decide what is more important to do uh, when, so. 
How well are we doing that in the neutrino community compared to other communities? I, I think it's a good question. I think we used to be quite bad at it. I think we're getting better slowly, uh, but, but it is very slow. I mean, uh, uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, private conversations about, uh, you know, the role of theory in the Dune collaboration. And I think the role is uh, small. And it's not because there aren't any theorists in the collaboration. You probably have too many theorists in the collaboration already. <laughs> but they're not used at all, or, or they're, they're underutilized. So I, I think if, you know, the Dune collaboration could definitely take advantage of their theorists at different places, including, you know, the cross-section questions, the energy resolution questions, energy reconstruction questions all the way to, uh, uh, you know, BSM models and things like that. And there are these theorists around and, and they could be used better by, by the neutrino community. I think that the collider community is in many quotes, much more advanced that way, but they have had a lot of time to, to get to where they are now. You know, they know that they're, in collider physics, you only find what you're looking for at the zero order. <laughs> and, and in neutrino physics, we're, we're probably going to get there very quickly. So you need to have some help in terms of what you should be looking for. Okay, so I think we are done for today. So thanks a lot to our panelists for participating in this discussion.